Welcome to PwC IFRS Talks, your source of all things IFRS, technical accounting matters, business issues, current standard setting and regulatory updates. I'm your host, Ruth Preedy. In today's episode, um, we're going to have a podcast about COVID, which we've not actually done for a while. And we're going to specifically talk about some of the employee accounting implications, I suppose. So for businesses, when they make a decision about an employee out of the back of COVID, what do they actually need to do in accounting? So it's not the most positive, I would say, in terms of podcast, but obviously something that businesses are talking about. So we wanted to take you through that. And to help me, I'm joined by Katie Woods. Welcome back, Katie. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me back. It's lovely to be here. I'm missing Katie because we're normally desk buddies. But obviously, <laughs> from home office land, we're not desk buddies that often. Um, no, but, but yeah. we've got the virtual podcast studio, and I'm I'm feeling it here. So that's it's lovely to be back. <laughs> okay, virtual hug from me. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> So lots of standards to consider and actually lots of aspects. So we'll probably do, you know, fairly high level on each, but just to give people the sort of things they need to be thinking about. Let's start with any implications on pensions. Yeah, and I mean, pensions are always a bit of the area where people think, oh, let's just keep going with the same accounting and it'll be all right. But, and as you say, these these are difficult conversations to be having, but the the true impact of COVID is that, that, certain changes will be made to benefits that employees are are receiving. And one of those might be in relation to their pension arrangements. So the first thing to think about is whether the pension has been perhaps curtailed. So that means where there's a significant reduction, perhaps in the number of employees covered by the plan, you know, maybe closing a certain element of the business or a discontinuance of an operation. And in that case, you've got to think about what I have cut back in my plan and how that should be accounted for. Compare that with a settlement. So a settlement would be, okay. I'm going to stop this pension arrangement now. It's a payment of benefits not set out in the terms of the plan. And it arises when the entity or a business enters into a transaction that eliminates all further legal constructive obligation as part of that plan. So in both cases, you've got to think, have I just curtailed or have I stopped the benefits? These are both, sorry, I should have said, these are both in relation to defined benefit pension plans. So these are ones where you're, you know how much the employee is going to get at the end versus a defined contribution benefit plan, much easier to account for because you're just taking however much goes in each month. You define the contribution to the employee. So these settlements and curtailments would be in the context of a defined benefit plan. And you need to think about the accounting, need to look at what the employees have been offered and see in the case of the curtailment, how those obligations have changed and what sort of assets are are covering the now obligations that you've got. So those are the sort of things you think about if there was a change to the defined benefit pension arrangement. There's also, having said, oh, let's just keep with what we've normally got for a uh, a pension plan, a defined benefit pension plan, because of the changes in the market and the impact on the yield of high quality corporate bonds, which are the way in which you measure the defined benefit scheme, you need to think about how those might have changed when we come to looking at the valuation going forward in the next year. So it's really thinking about those assumptions, looking at how the defined benefit obligation fits in with with the plan assets and making sure that any changes that have been communicated to employees are then reflected in the accounting. Does, Does that make sense, Ruth? Yeah, it does. So two two sort of things not to overlook, I suppose. It's quite easy, isn't it? In when there's so many other things going on to maybe ignore the pensions, but do actually some of these market changes affect like the discount rate but also Mm. are there actual fundamental changes to the business that means the pension scheme has changed yeah okay so pensions number one next thing although potentially unlikely there's a obviously you could have bonuses or you might have a bonus accrual in your books what do people need Mm -hmm. to think about for that one yeah that's right and and bonuses can take all shape and and size but Usually, again, you'd say, well, this is our bonus, which we are offering to employees, and we'll, we'll charge it over the, to the financial statements, to the income statement, over the period that the employee is earning it. That's generally how you would do it. And of course, when we started last financial year, let's assume we're looking at calendar year, 
we wouldn't have known about the the massive impact that, that the pandemic has had. And so it's thinking about what the expectations are on the part of the employee. Have the employees signed up to this? Has something again been communicated to employees to reduce that expectation? So those short-term bonuses would be spread to the profit and loss account over the period that it's being worked for. But you need to think about how that might be measured as a consequence of where the business is. And I, I mean, there are so many different ways of measuring or the way in which the bonus is provided to employees, but they might be linked to an earnings number or another profit measure. They might be in relation to number of contracts earned. So really having a look at what the terms are with employees and making sure that the measurement is correctly reflecting that that bonus or, you know, there's a possibility bonuses won't be paid and therefore that would need to be removed from the financial statements, that provision. Brilliant. So just build, building in your expectations there around, I suppose, what realistically is going to be paid out. Mm. Um, Moving on, so another point we've obviously, many listeners might have already had to do this, is all around self-isolation and sick pay. Is there anything that people need to think about there in terms of the accounting? Yeah, and I'm going to do my um, accounting standard bingo here, but it's IS19, which is the standard that we're pretty much looking at for all of this. So it's the employee benefit standard. But IS19 isn't just the pension standard. I think it's sort of uh, reflectors is normally expecting it to be the pension standard, but it's more. And and um, so employee benefits, other employee benefits over and above pension arrangements uh, are included in that standard. And it's really looking at the same things that we were just talking about. So you need to consider whether there's a legal or constructive obligation to employees. So in connection with sick pay or if the employee is required to self-isolate, what are the agreements that you've you've, uh, entered into with employees? Or indeed, has a constructive obligation been uh, set out there as a consequence again of communication, or perhaps some employees have been given benefits while self-isolating and thinking of how that might affect other employees. So again, an area, I mean, you summarise the bonuses very, very succinctly, Ruth, but we're Sorry, looking at what... I no, no, missed everything. <laughs> no, 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 it's brilliant because you just said you look at what you've offered to the employees and whether that is being correctly reflected in the financial statements and something like sick pay is no different. Perfect. What is accounting standard bingo? Why have I never played this game before? Well, I like to mention them when I'm talking, you know, okay. just generally about accounting. I think we don't mention the numbers. Always have to give the name as well, but we don't mention the numbers enough. Do you see what I mean? Um, okay. And what about paragraphs, numbers? I oh, love it. You yeah, love that. Paragraph paragraph numbers. Numbers. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, see if you can get a paragraph. Like, I'm going to test you now. See if you can get oh, a paragraph no. number okay. to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so still in IS19, I think, I could be wrong because it's not my uh, area of expertise, termination arrangements. So again, not a positive one, but what, what do we need to think about for if there's a termination arrangement? Sure. And and it is IS19, you're right. I, I would, the reason I thought we could probably talk about termination arrangements is because you need to determine whether a termination arrangement has been earned by an employee and that would be something that's a post-employment benefit and compare that with a termination benefit where a a company has said to an employee either unfortunately we're going to pay you because you need to leave or indeed offering a voluntary redundancy. So if you're looking at post-employment benefit and it has been earned over a period by an employee pension is a good example but there might be post-employment medical benefits or something like that then you'd spread that cost over the period that the employee has earned it in comparison if the company's decision to terminate an employee's an employee's employment or indeed the employee has has accepted a voluntary redundancy in exchange for benefits, those would be treated at a point in time that the agreement comes into place. So when it's both the employer has offered and the employee has accepted, it would be at that time that you would provide for that termination benefit. So the first one, the post-employment benefit is spread, the termination benefit is at the point when it's agreed. Brilliant. Point of time over time. Feels like we're in IFRS 15, I doesn't know. it? I, just, I can't get away from it, can I? But, well. <laughs> um, there is, it's probably worth just mentioning the sort of characteristics of termination benefits just to help. 
Sure. And they're benefits offered for a clearly defined period. There's no legal or constructive obligation on the employee, um, you know, to, to extend. Uh, and there's no linking to the amount of benefit to the length of service that the employee is given. So uh, those three characteristics would just highlight to you whether it's a termination benefit or not. Brilliant. And termination benefit, point in time. Yeah, well done. Perfect. Got it. She was listening. <laughs> OK, not that I want you to move out of IS-19, but there is other standards. So we're going to move to IFRS 2, share-based payments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to think about that. Um, yeah, so share-based payments, um, actually, my favourite accounting standard. I know a lot of people don't like them, this one, but... Um, there fact, is, I spoke there, to someone earlier that said it was their favourite standard as well, Katie. Oh, I must meet them. <laughs> I'll introduce um, you. <laughs> so um, I think here, when an arrangement for an equity or a cash set or share-based payment comes into to place, you need to think about if terms are going to be changed. So if the business perhaps isn't doing as well, then I think that you need to think about if you if the entity is going to modify what's going to be given to employees. So the sort of thing might happen is that the period over which those that share based payment might be earned might be increased. You might have a longer period of time. Or there might be perhaps reduced criteria, vesting conditions that need to be satisfied for that share based payment arrangement. So it's it's those sort of things that you need to think about in the context of a modification. And when you're accounting for a modification, the, the things you need to think about is, is it to benefit the employee? So if it benefits the employee, then you look at an uplift in the value. So you'd look at the original share based payment arrangement and the new share based payment arrangement. And you look at the fair value of that equity instrument at the date of the modification. So the fair value of the old award and the new award at the date of modification and any uplift you'd spread over the future future vesting period and then the original award would continue in the background. So basically what you're saying is my original award I've got today and then I've done an uplift so that needs to go on a bit further for the, the, the arrangement that's been put in place. Now a modification is different from a cancellation. If you've got a cancellation, the expectation and people generally don't like this. So if if entities are thinking of cancelling awards, just be aware that if you cancel an award, then you just have to accelerate all of the costs that hasn't been taken. And, and there's no change for what might have happened or might not happen. You just take the full charge through in your profit and loss account. So if there's a cancellation, but a replacement and they're clearly linked to each other, then you would actually treat that as a modification. OK, so cancellations are, are difficult. They, they end up with a charge to the P&L. Modification, you might get a slightly higher charge. So if you've got a cancellation with a, a replacement award, just check if they're closely linked, then it may well be treated as a modification. That, does that make sense? It does. Tricky one, though. So key, I know this is something generally, well, I think generally people struggle with. So to, to mm. the difference between modification and cancellation there. And modification, I always think you almost treat it like an, you know, an additional award, don't you? you keep going with the first mm -hmm. one, then you've got this extra bit of fair value to keep spreading. Yes, and cancellation, not so fun because you get a nice big hit to your P&L. You do. And I, I mean, I, what I said with the cancellation was there'd be no adjustment. There, There is another view that you make the best estimate. A number of people would, would be there at the end of the vesting period and, and assess what that would be. But zero people is probably not the right answer because that would lead to a zero charge. There is a general consensus that a cancellation would take a, a one off hit at the time that you cancel. Brilliant. Thank mm. you. I think unless I'm wrong, I think we've covered every aspect that people might need to think about in terms of employees and accounting that is anyway do you is there anything we missed out on I don't think so I mean what we wanted to do was just to give a high level a sort of pointers for yeah. people to think about not a very nice subject as you said but but certainly just pointers and, and areas to think about 
And I think there's some different FAQs as well, isn't there? If people want to read it in the COVID in depth. So if you wanted to read about some of these things, there is further guidance as well. Well, thank mm-hmm. you, Katie. Like you said, not the most positive topic. So we'll have to have you back to talk about something a bit more positive, but hopefully very useful to our listeners anyway. So thank you for coming. And listeners, thank, thank you. you for listening. Stay safe and happy accounting. The preceding program was brought to you by Price Waterhouse Coopers LLP. This content is for general information purposes and is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.